Hi, and welcome to episode 23 of Understanding Darktable. Again, this week we're going to cover two modules, the Snapshots module and the History Stack. So, let's jump right on in. Okay, so I've got this randomly selected image from a holiday to Borneo in 2015. And I've uh, got this fella sitting on his front porch, peeling vegetables of some description. Okay, so we've got our history stack here. And the way the history stack works is everything begins with a state zero original. And essentially that is the very raw image that was brought in. Now, when I say raw, I mean untouched by Darktable. Doesn't mean it has to be a raw file, it could be a JPEG, it could be a TIFF, could be a PNG. But essentially that very first state, before you've done anything or before Darktable has done anything to the image, is referred to as state zero original. Now, with a raw file, and usually with JPEGs as well as far as I know, Darktable will assess the orientation of the image and it picks that up from the EXIF metadata of the image. And that usually comes from the camera. The camera normally writes into the EXIF metadata which orientation it was being held in at the time that the shutter was released. So if it's level, it stores it as landscape. If it's vertical, it stores it as portrait. And Darktable reads that information from the EXIF metadata. It will usually then apply a sharpen preset and then the base curve based on the model of camera that shot the image. Those three things are normally standard. In this particular image, Darktable also applied a profile denoise routine and an input color profile. I haven't yet read up on what makes it decide to do those two things and what when not to do them, because sometimes it does and sometimes it doesn't. And basically, as you can see, I've then gone and done a crop and rotate, a grain, and a local contrast. Now, for every action you take on an image in Darktable, in the Darkroom module, a new entry gets added to this history stack. So if I was to say, come over to our contrast brightness and saturation, and desaturate that image, that now appears as another entry in the history stack. Now at any point that you decide you don't like what you've done with the processing, you can jump back simply by left clicking on any prior state from the history stack and everything above it will be undone and the image will return to that state. So in this instance, we've got the grain module applied, but the local contrast and the contrast brightness and saturation modules have now been deactivated. You'll also find as you do more and more processing, sometimes you'll revisit a module that you've already activated. Let's suppose I was to decide, yeah, I'm not really happy with that crop. I want to tweak that crop again. So I go to my crop and rotate tool and I go, yeah, really should have cropped that a bit tighter. So I'll crop it a bit tighter. I've obviously got this set to freehand. Yes, I have. So I just go, I'm going to do that. You'll notice that in the history stack, we now have two separate entries for crop and rotate. And that is because the first one, item number six, was the very first crop that I did, which was how this was a moment ago. And then state eight is the crop that I just did. So if I wanted to jump back to that original crop, I could just click on six and we're back to that point. Now we might decide, no, I do like it cropped a little bit tighter. And when you have spent a lot of time processing an image and you've used lots of modules and you've done lots of things, this history stack might get up to, you know, 50, 70, 80, 100 items in the stack. And a lot of those items could be repeats like this crop and rotate. So that's where the compress history stack option becomes a nice way to tidy up the history stack. What it will do is look for duplicate entries within the history stack and throw them out and leave you with the topmost entry for any repeated module. 
So if I was to compress the history stack now, I would end up with a single crop and rotate entry in the history stack, which would reflect this current crop because that is the top most setting in the history stack. So we go compress history stack and we can see now that the one that was in between input color profile and grain has disappeared. Now I'm just going to move on to this next image because it's the first of a batch of images of these orangutans. Now let's suppose that I wanted to do a square crop on these orangutans and I want to make them monochrome. Just bear with me here. It's quite conceivable that at some point you're going to want to process a whole bunch of images in the same way because they were all shot at the same time and they're all of a consistent subject matter and you want a consistent look across all of those images. So maybe I want them all monochrome and I want them all square. Maybe I'm going to process them a little bit further, maybe I'm going to do a split tone, whatever. That's where styles are a great shortcut and we create a style through this icon in the bottom right hand corner of the history stack. We click on that button and we get this create new style dialog box. Now these first two fields aren't named in the UI, but the first field is for the name of the style. So I'll call it square one. The second field is for a description. So I'm gonna go square crop, 1600 grain, monochrome. And what I'll do is choose which states from my current history stack I would like to be replicated across any images I decide to apply this style to. So I might go, well, I don't want to do the orientation because some of the images might be shot landscape and some of them might be shot portrait. So I don't want to apply the same orientation to all images because it'll work for some but not for others. So we'll leave that out. But yeah, maybe I want the sharpen and maybe I want the base curve and maybe I want denoise and the input color profile. So I want all of those except for orientation. And I click on save. Now, all of those things are saved as a style. And to use that, I wasn't going to cover styles in this particular episode, but it looks like we are now. I move on to the next image. I jump back to the light table. I go to styles and there's square one. And I simply double click on it. And that set of instructions has been applied to that image. And then I can move to all four of those images, double click square one and all of them get that same style applied to them. Now, obviously you can take it a lot further and include a lot more things in the preset if you so desire. Okay, we weren't meant to cover styles. I'll have to add that to this particular episode's title. What we were gonna look at though, was the notion of snapshots. Okay, let's have a look at snapshots. Now, the thing to understand about snapshots is they behave a little bit differently to some other development engines, okay? When we create a snapshot, Darktable is essentially taking a bitmap image and copying it to the clipboard of just the area comprised of your image in the middle of the Darktable interface, right? So if I go take snapshot, it creates a snapshot called contrast, brightness, saturation, eight. And that name refers to the state of the history panel at which that snapshot was taken. So it's basically a reminder to you. This is when you took that snapshot. Was it the eighth state of the history stack? Now we can jump back in the history stack to an earlier point, like so, and compare the snapshot with this state of the image. And we do that by simply left clicking once on the entry in the snapshot module. And we get this line across our image. Now, depending on whether or not you've recently used this module, this line might be vertical or it might be horizontal. Either way, you can left click and drag 
to compare the two different states of the image. One, which is a bitmap of the screen capture, and one, which is an earlier state of your actual image file. Now, you might be wondering, why is he obsessing over this bitmap screen capture thing? Well, here's why. I can zoom in on my image, but I can't zoom in on the snapshot because it is simply a screen grab. That's all it is. So I zoom out and I go, hmm, I want to process this image a little differently. And this is a trap for young players because the way the history panel works is I'm currently back at state three, base curve. If I now apply any other module or tweak any parameter within any other module, I will lose all of these states from state four to state eight. They will just disappear forever and they will not be recoverable. So if you want to try a couple of different ways of processing an image, I highly recommend that you use the duplicate feature, which I've covered in a previous video, but just very quickly, jump back into the light table, make sure you've got the image selected, go over to selected images and click on duplicate. That will not duplicate the raw file, it will simply create a new version of the XMP sidecar file and it'll allow you to create two different processing regimes for the same image and allow you to then choose how you want to proceed from there. But assuming we have not done that and that we didn't know what was about to happen, we'll go back into the dark room. So let's suppose I now said, oh, I want to put a frame on this. So I'll click on my Bruce Williams photography. There's my frame, but look at what happened to the history stack. All those other steps in the processing are now gone and they cannot be brought back. And the snapshot, that's of no use to us whatsoever because it's just a screen grab. So just be aware of that trap. Okay, we could now go to snapshots and we could take another snapshot. So now we've got a snapshot called framing four, which again represents the history stack at the point in time at which that snapshot was taken. And I could now go ahead and process the image differently if I so chose. So I might go, well, I don't want the frame now. So I'll turn the frame off. But I'm still looking at the snapshot that I shot first. So now I can go to snapshots, click on the second snapshot, and there's the second snapshot there. And this is my actual image here. And we can see that because I can zoom in on it. And now I might go and do some other radical processing. I don't know, let's say I'm going to go and do something stupid like crank the shadows and highlights. And again, I can just swipe between the two states of the image. Now, you may have noticed the little curved arrow in the middle. That is there to allow us to change the rotation of the swipe. So we just left click once and now we can drag from side to side to compare between the two states of the image. But again, just to reiterate in case you haven't got it yet, we cannot jump back to the way the image was when we took that snapshot because that is no longer represented. Well, in this case I can because I can jump back to framing and then reactivate the frame module. But if you've made other changes with other modules, then those history states will be gone. Finally, in the top right hand corner of the snapshots module, we've got the reset button and that will remove our little line and get rid of whatever snapshots we've taken. All right, I think that just about does it for styles, the history stack and snapshots. Any questions or comments, leave them down below. I'll do my best to answer them and I'll see you in the next one.